We're starting a new series today called How to Love. And we're going to go to what some theologians call the most neglected book in all of the Bible. We're going to be in Song of Solomon. Julia was teaching out of this book last week as well. And Song of Solomon. Solomon, if you don't know much about Solomon, he is the third king of Israel. His grandfather was Saul. He is the son of David. Solomon is, he is the man. He is, the Bible calls him the wisest man to ever walk the face of the earth. What a line, the wisest man. The only problem with that is with all of Solomon's wisdom, he just unfortunately couldn't apply his wisdom, which proves to us, even though you know a lot does not mean you do a lot. So just because you in church doesn't mean you following Jesus. He woke up and chose violence. So Solomon is wise, and we see right here, look at the first scripture in Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 1, the song of songs, which is Solomon's. Now Solomon, if you don't know much about him, he gave his life to learning about life. He wanted to be wise. He wanted to figure out, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, he wanted to figure out the meaning of life. And he was a poet. He was a songwriter. In fact, Solomon wrote over a thousand songs. And out of the thousand songs that he wrote, we believe this was his best song. So you know how you have the holy of holies, or we serve the king of kings. This is the song of all the songs. This is, in fact, I'll give you the title of today's message. It is called The Greatest Love Song Ever Written. On the Single Awareness Day on, on the 14th this week, I went to Spotify and I put in classic love songs. Like, why put, it, put together a playlist when I can just go to other people's curated playlists? One of the songs came up and Julia gave me that look like, did you choose this? And I was like, don't, don't get mad at me. This is a playlist, okay? But out of all the songs, the Celine Dion's and, and the, the Casey and JoJo's, <laughs> close to me, she like my brother. Love my sister. Anyways, um, out of all the love songs, this is the greatest love song. It is the song of songs. And in this book, we see four different areas, stages of relationship. In the song of songs, we see dating. We see, see courtship. The longing to be intimate, the longing to be together, which I just want to say, dating is, dating is so funny to me. Like, I think we got it all wrong in dating. I think, I, I want to go back. Adam had it easy in the Bible. Like, God just dropped up off a girl and was like, here you go. <laughs> like, how easy is that? Nowadays, you got to date, and you date somebody that's trying to hide their worst. They're trying to hide who they are, and then they get, you get married, and you're like, wait, hold up. That's who you are? I wish we could go back to Adam days. So you see courtship, you see dating in the book of Song of Solomon. You see, you see the wedding, the feast, and the, and, and, and the celebration. You see the honeymoon. Oh, don't get it twisted. Song of Solomon is, is rated R. But it's rated R for realistic and, and I think growing up in church, you know, people, some people are like, wow. That's signs that they are not married. <laughs> married people just kind of, just kind of like, single people are like, wow, what's that like? It's rated R for realistic because, because God is the author of desire. He's the author of relationship. He's the author of sex. And if that makes you uncomfortable, you ought to get to know God a little bit better. See, because in, in church, I grew up in church, we don't talk, we do not talk about that. We do not talk about, we don't, we can talk about money. We can talk about forgiveness. We can't talk about, you know, the bad stuff. No, it's, it's not bad. It's from God. It's a gift from God. And, and, and God, God wanted you to know what he thinks about it so much, he dedicated one whole book of the Bible so you could learn his heart on it. So we see dating, we see, we see wedding, we see honeymoon. In fact, you're going to see if you look, read through the book of Song of Songs, he basically says to his guys, hey, guys, I got to go. You have, have the, all the steak you want, but I'm going to enjoy my wife who I've been waiting for. We're going to go to our honeymoon. We're going to Cabo tonight. He's excited. 
You see marriage in the book of Song of Songs. You see the dynamics of marriage. In fact, 25% of this book is dedicated to conflict resolution. And so we don't look at this book of love as just going like, wow, the infatuation, the desire, the romance. Actually, God also shows us what it means to have conflict and resolution in a marriage. So God wants us to know how to love. I figure if we're going to learn about love, instead of going to a love doctor, we should go to the author of love. We should go to the one that invented love. In fact, I'm going to give you four things to write down today to encourage you in your faith. Write down the first one. Love was created by God. Love was created by God because God is love. One of my favorite things about God is he does not do love. He is love. In fact, the Bible says it in this way. 1 John chapter 4, look at this verse with me. 1 John 4, listen to this. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. There is no fear in love. In love, there's no fear. Why? Because, because, because God's there. And so when I come into a relationship with Jesus, I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to feel shame because all the fear has been removed. I am in front of the God of love. In fact, there are four loves in the Bible. Well, there's many loves, but I want to give you four Greek words for love in the Bible. Here's the first one. There's the, the word phileo. Phileo, the Greek word, is like brotherly love. It's like city of Philadelphia where, you know, you, you, you have the guys that get into the Super Bowl, but they can't win. Um, I'm just having fun. I enjoyed the commercials. Um, so phileo love is brotherly love. This morning, Julie and I were getting ready for church, and um, our, our seven-year-old slept in his older brother's bed. And so the two younger, they go, because the seven-year-old loves to sleep. And so the two younger go to wake him up, and the three of them are just in the bed. They're wrestling, and they're laughing hysterically. They're just wrestling, and they're laughing, and they're waking up their brother. And I said, Julia, listen to that sound. And they're giggling as brothers. They have brotherly love. So there's a love that God gives for you that's like for your brothers, but also like your friends. Like, I love you like a brother. We're not f flesh and blood, but we're, we're brothers. We're brothers in Christ. We're brothers. Okay, so there's phileo, there's eros, which is erotic love, which is romance, intimacy, which is God-given. And so we see this in the scriptures. There's that love between a husband and a wife. We see that. And then there's also a, a love called storge. Storge is family love, like your spiritual family, like the family that you have that, that is your flesh and blood. Like I love my parents. I love my, my brother and my sister. And the last one is the ultimate love, and that is agape love, which is unconditional love. That God says, whether you're doing good or you're doing bad, I love you. Whether you're in the best season or the worst season, I am not a, lot, a God of conditions. These are my requirements to earn my love. No, God just says, I love you. And when you're doing your worst and you totally rebel against me and you turn your back and you're in sin, I'm still going to love you. Because guess what? You're mine. And I created you. Anybody thankful today that the ultimate love is the agape love that is found in Jesus? Because I tell you, phileo love is great, but it's not, it's not going to sustain you. Storge love, that's amazing, but it's not going to complete you or heal you. You need the agape love of God. And so the author of love, the author of, God, of, of the love that you desire and crave. Listen, if you get married your spouse is there to compliment you, but your spouse can never complete you. Only the love of God can fully complete you. And so you need agape love, unconditional love that comes from God. That God, why do we love God? We love God because he first loved us. In fact, our love for God is just a response to his pursuit, his desire. If you're wondering how much God loves you today, God is the kind of God that would leave 99 people at the West Side location. Like, I'm just praying there's 99 people there today. <laughs> just throwing out that faith number in Jesus' name. God is the God that would leave 99 church people, saved people, doing good people, to go find you and to bring you back. Why? Because he's so mad at you? 
think the way you should see God is he's so madly in love with you. So God is the author of love. God gave us his love. He is the one that loves us and died for us. So we first find love, the purest form of love, from God. But God also, write down number two today, God, he gave you desire. Desire was created by God. God gave you your hormones and your pheromones. God gave you your desire, your cravings, your appetite. That has been God, and because it is God-given, it must become God-guided. Because God gave you these desires, it's very important that God gets a say in these desires, that we, we adhere to his ways, his truths, what God plans for us, what God wants for us. Well, look at the next scripture and watch this. This is an amazing verse in Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 7. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles, by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. Other translations say, until it is due. In other words, let God control these desires. You ever meet a couple and they've been, they've been together for like two weeks and they're like, we're getting married. And you're like, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, we just, whoo! We're in love. Ah! I don't know. I think you're in like. Love is not an emotion. Love is a decision. And so he says, no, 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 don't wake up this desire. You got to temper it. You got to monitor it. You got to let God be. See, I think the greatest way to follow Jesus is allow God to be in control of your decisions. You can't live off impulse. You can't live off desire. It is God given, but it must be God guided. God, because if, if 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 it doesn't happen, and you live off impulse, and you live off craving, and you live off desire, what will happen is that will lead to destruction. Oh, look at Proverbs 5. I love this scripture. It says, it says this, drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. No, no, no. What, 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 he, what he's saying there is, listen, Drink from clean water. Drink from the water that is blessed. Drink from the water that brings healing. See, this water, it, it, I'm telling you, it will please and it will satisfy. Anything outside of that will destroy it's like, do you want clean water or do you want toxic water? Do you, do you want that will, which will satisfy or that which will leave you empty? We have to allow God to speak to us about our desires. And so God is showing us in this book, desire is not bad. I mean, these two, they are passionate. They, if, you, if, you, if you read through Song of Solomon, they're like, I have wanted, I've been longing for you. I want to see you. I want to be with you. This is like listening to Boys to Men when I was in the sixth grade. I was like, oh my gosh, what are these lyrics? All those times at night when you hurt me and you ran off with that other fella. I'm, I mean, I'm 12 years old crying. What a, yeah. I can't relate at all. I'm like, that was the worst. Why'd you do that? I don't even have a girlfriend. <laughs> Baby, I knew about it. See, I just didn't care. Like, that's as low as my register goes, by the way. That's about as good. <laughs> Desire is a good thing. That you desire to be with someone, desire to be wed, desire to be married. It's a desire, it's a beautiful, it's a gift from God. I love what C.S. Lewis says. Listen to this. C.S. Lewis says, God made pleasure. It is the invention of God, not the devil. And you ever notice what God creates, what God makes, the devil always wants to distort. He always wants to mix up. He always wants to convolute. He always wants to say, oh, if you're in love, if you're in, well, if you're in love, how could we stop you? If you're in love, how could we stand in the way? No, 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 no. We've got to go by God's ways. 
God's truths, God's precepts, the way God thinks, the way God talks. He's put this book here so we understand what he wants us to do. So God created love and God created desire. Desire is not a bad thing. Look at this next verse, uh, Song of Solomon 2, 14. Oh, my dove in the cleft of the rocks, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face is loving. This is what Julia says to me every day. You know how hard my life is? She's like, come home. Stop traveling. Come home to me, my love. And do the dishes and pick up the kids and take care of your trash and pick up your own laundry. I'm kidding. It was just yesterday. Anyways, um, <laughs> desire is a beautiful thing. Desire, I don't, see, and some of us have to understand that desire, when it is God-guided, God will allow you and show you what to do with your desires. Don't. Stir up or awaken love until the time is due. Allow God, and what I love about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, what does he give you? When you walk with the Holy Spirit, he gives you love, joy, peace, patience. If you're dating today and you love your guy and you think he's great, he's going to be great in six months. Right? So let's see. I don't think he is, but let's see. I, I met that joker. I don't know. It's a lot of cologne, in my opinion. That's a lot of cologne. That's a whole lot of aqua de gia up in this place. That man killing me with that Santel. I don't know if it's going to work. Let God guide. Let God speak in. God, hear me today. God should be able to speak to you about every area of your life. And you ever notice that you get yourself in trouble and you're like, God, I give you everything except for this thing. Because this is between me and, don't even say it's between you and Jesus because it ain't. It's between you and you. So you got to be careful because love is from God. He wrote the book on love. He is love. He wants to show you all the loves, the phileo and the storge and the, the eros and the agape. But we got to learn how to love from God. And we got to let God talk to us about our desires. Write down number three. Marriage was created by God. Marriage is not man's idea. Marriage is God's idea. And I love this verse. Look at, this is quoted from the Old Testament. Well, watch Matthew 19. Matthew 19, verse 4. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them, he made them. So we got to understand, God made us. God created the world. He did not just create dolphins and trees and stars. He created us. He made them at the beginning, made them male and female, and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. So, in fact, if you watch the book of Song of Solomon, you are watching leaving and cleaving and weaving. The, the Shulamite girl is leaving her family to be joined to the Song of Solomon. By the way, the reason why there's such pure language here from Solomon, Solomon is going to eventually marry 699 other women. Help me, Jesus. Okay, okay, but this is his first. This is his first. And that's why there's purity here. That's why there's such intention and passion and desire. You can't tell me he got to 634 and he's like, it's only you for me. <laughs> like, does she believe that? There's, there, there, there's desire here. And so you see, you see leaving, you see cleaving, coming together. Hey, guys, have fun. Chicken, steak on me. Have all the drink you want. I just got married. I'm going to Cabo. So he's leaving, he's cleaving, the two shall become one. The two shall become one. And then there's weaving, there's joining together two lives. I want to tell you, if you are married, the reason why you have marriage problems is for two reasons. If you have problems in your marriage, it is quite simply for two reasons. Number one is because you're human. <laughs> How's that for rocket science? <laughs> Hold on, pastor, let me write that down. That guy's good, man. He's good. You're human. You're flawed. You're broken. You got issues. You, 
I've said it a million times here, but you got trauma and drama, and you were raised by daddy and mama. You're a human. You got problem. Anybody here is under construction? Anybody? Anybody hoping to get a little bit better? Anybody else? Yeah. So you got issues. And so you're human. And we've taken two humans and joined them together. They have left their trust fund family and they've come together. <laughs> Try and break them, them off from that trust fund. They, they, they are coming together. The two shall become one. And so when you, whenever you put two strong-willed individuals together, there's going to be conflict. Because number one, you're human. And number two, write it down, you're different. You, you, you like, like different things. You want to eat at different places. You, you want different temperatures. <laughs> Half of my marital issues could be solved if I controlled the temperature. <laughs> Is it my bad I want to sleep at 71 degrees? It's not my bad. It's the way God created me. Julia would like to sleep in Antarctica. <laughs> and it's sin. It's, sin. it's her sin. It's her issue to deal with. It's not my bad. I was crucified with Christ. <laughs> and so, and so you, you're different and you're human and so you have problems. Look at this great scripture. It actually happens at the beginning of the, the, the book, but I really love this verse. I've always held on to this verse. Look at Song of Solomon 2.15. Catch us the foxes, the little foxes, that spoil the vines. Why do people get divorced? Divorce doesn't knock on somebody's door like a big bear and go, this cataclysmic, insane event is going to make us get divorced. It's not how divorces happen. Divorce happens with a slow leak. Not addressing little issues. Not addressing things. Not, not, not being committed to resolve. Not being committed to... You know, I heard someone say one time, to date is to date with your eyes wide open. If you're dating, you should date the person like this. <laughs> Could you end up on a Netflix special? <laughs> eyes wide open. To be married is to have your eyes half closed. It's just that simple. Because to be married, you got to just go like, well, that's who they are. That's how it goes. I don't really care that much. It's okay with me. Anybody could get married. In fact, I will just tell you, getting married is the easiest part. You think a, a, a wedding's hard? You get a DJ, a photographer, and call it good. You're married. Congratulations. Have the cake. Cut it. Put it on each other's face. Ah, you're married. <laughs> it's that easy. It's that easy. It's that easy. Post about on Instagram. Wow, you're married. Go to Vegas. I don't care. You're married. Getting married is easy. Staring, staying married is hard work. And staying happily married is a fine art and a lifetime of hard work. Happily married. And so marriage is God's plan. Marriage is God's idea. And this is what God, he said, no, don't, don't, don't stay at home too long. You, you can go off to college, you can come back for maybe, you know, 90 days, but you got to get your own place and you got to get your own bank account and you got to leave our house and go find somebody to be wed with and leave and cleave and then weave your lives together. The reason why Julie and I, we made a commitment, we are not going to let anything come between our marriage because we are married. We're weaving our lives together, our values together. We're finding how we see money, how we see parenting, how we see life, how we see friendship. We're weaving our lives together. This is God's plan for your life. So love is, is God created, and, and, and desire is from God. Does, and and it's, it should be pure. The marriage bed should be pure, not undefiled, because it's a gift from God. And, and, and marriage is from God. And if you're wondering, how do I make my marriage better? Well, let's go to Jesus, who is the gold standard of how to make a marriage better. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loves the church. The church is his bride. So, of course, Jesus wants the church to, to, to be radiant and to be beautiful. 
The, the, the church is reflection of the love of Jesus. And so he's beautifying the church. He's purifying the church. He's exhorting the church. He's encouraging the church. That's how we serve our spouse. That's how we serve our bride. And the last thing I want to tell you, this is the fourth and the final thing. I just want to tell you that you've got to love. To love someone is to give and forgive. Is to have an exuberant, over-the-top generosity to have a thriving relationship is to give a lot and to forgive a lot. And the moment you stop being generous to your significant other, kiss the whole thing goodbye. And the moment you stop forgiving. So to be in love, what does that mean, in love? To be in love means to be in commitment. It is not the eros. It is not the, she's like, oh gosh, the language, if you read it, the reason why it's rated R, realistic, is because they are like, I, I long for you. By the way, there's nothing worse than a passionless marriage. There's nothing worse than a loveless marriage. And I pray over the marriages of our church, I pray over our community, that we'll fall more in love with each other. To be married means to become an expert in the other person. That I study Julia. I want to know, what does she want? What would she prefer? What would she like? What, it, what would she be into? What would she want to go eat? Where would she want, what would she want to watch? What would she want to see? Okay, Okay, fine. The temperature, we can go down to 59 degrees. That's fine. <laughs> but when you're asleep, I might jump it up for a few hours, but I'll be up before you and then you will never know. <laughs> but to love is to give and to forgive. And who does this for us the most is Jesus. All God does for you is give and forgive. He gives you life. He gives you mercy. He gives you compassion. He gives you faithfulness because of the steadfast love of the Lord. You're not consumed by wrath. His mercies are new every day. And so God gives and gives and gives. You ever, you ever, has this ever happened to you? Have you ever got a blessing and tried to trace it back to your activity? Have you ever get some blessing? You're like, oh yeah, it's because I, and then you're like, but I didn't do nothing. So why did you hook? it's because you love me. If you keep record of wrongs in your marriage, your marriage will never survive. That's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not rude, it is not proud, it is not easily provoked to anger. Love always trusts, always hopes, love always protects, and love never fails. Is that talking about the love of Dr. Phil? It's talking about the love of Jesus the way that God loves us. And if you receive God's love, you can give God's love. But if you hate yourself, you'll hate your spouse. If you can't forgive yourself, you'll never forgive your spouse. This is the song of songs. The greatest love song that's ever been written. It's got passion and beauty and conflict and resolution and marriage and understanding, even in their old age. Look at, look at, just look at this last verse, 2 Solomon 8, 14, or so Song of Solomon 8, 14. Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountain of spices. Even when they were older and married, they still wanted each other. We got a lot of marriages that just tolerate one another. What if you started to mix in some desire and some passion and some commitment? You got to give and forgive. I, I, I just, I'm passionate about this book. I'm passionate about this message. And I've been saying it all week. I can't wait to preach this message. I can't wait to preach this message. I can't wait to preach this message because I believe in order for you to mature in Christ, you need the whole counsel of God. I don't want to preach the gospels and the Psalms, but you not know the whole counsel of God. This is how God sees one of the most important parts of your life. And we want you to survive. Some of us, the moment I started talking, the moment I said sex, everybody's like, oh God, are we doing that in church? Did he say that? Yeah, the Bible said it. So God's not blushing. God's teaching. Because he wants you to know how to handle this big issue in your life. And the way that we handle it is we just go to the author. What do you say? Because I know I got these desires, but I, but I want you to guide. And um, I don't just want to get married. I want to have a, 
I think that the greatest testimony we have to the outside world is a healthy marriage. In fact, for some of us, maybe we should stop studying the Bible and start studying our spouse. Maybe the, the amount of time we've been putting into our spiritual life, maybe we could put it into our relationships. Because I don't want to live in a, in a loveless church, a lifeless church. And the church will be healthy and vibrant if our marriages are healthy and vibrant. Amen? And so we're listening and leaning into God and saying, Lord, isn't it, isn't it amazing? Wouldn't it be the ploy and the tactic of the enemy to make this book the most neglected book in all of the Bible? So, 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 let's find out what the internet says and what this expert says. And let's find out what they're saying. I, I don't know about you, but I'm just kind of like, I'm into what God's saying. I'm going to build my life on what God says. The grass may wither and the flower may fade, but the word of the Lord will last forever. Come on, stand to your feet, stand to your feet. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that today you're a good God. We thank you that today you're a God that opens up our eyes and our ears to your love. So we're praying today, God, that you